Welcome again to the New Voices. I'm Jim Lane with Biofuels Digest, and tonight we're going to be looking at all kinds of crazy subjects. Oil prices we're going to start with. The oil prices are low right now. Are they going to stay low forever? Is pain in the pump a thing of the past? We're going to look at celebrity investors, who's in the sector and why. Oil prices, they're low. We love it. We're happy. No pain at the pump. Is it gone forever? We hear $15 oil. We hear the kingdom can make money off $10 oil. Is, is the world of low-priced oil, is it here forever? Or is those rumors we heard from an energy minister at OPEC who said $200 oil might be there in the future. Where are we? What's mm -hmm. going on? I mean, I, th I think it would be foolish to try and predict what's going to happen with the oil price. I think, I mean, you're saying it's people are loving it. I'm not sure everyone is loving it. I think there's been a huge number of layoffs from oil companies in the U.S. I think the oil industry is very pretty unhappy. If you talk to Venezuelans and Libyans, I'm sure they'd say the same thing. Um, I don't think it's sustainable, This the price we have at the moment, if the industry is going to be as big as it has been in the last year or so. Um, I suppose when I look at this, you need to think about uh, how can you make it, how is this an opportunity? I think for biofuel industry, it's tough. If you're competing, if you're having to price your ethanol and your biodiesel and your natural gas um, fuel with oil, I don't know, it's difficult to make a profit. But I think there are definite opportunities. I think, um, unfortunately, oil companies doing badly means we're going to see less investment from them probably in, in renewable fuels, mm -hmm. um, just because they don't have the money. Um, but I think there are, there are interesting technologies that a lot of companies are coming up with. I mean, maybe going a bit off piece, but I know Solozyme is looking at developing new drilling fuels for oil rigs. So a number of rigs that couldn't make a profit today with, with the oil price, if they were using new renewable lubricants and oils, they actually can. It reduces their drilling time by, I don't know, two days, which means they break even rather than not. So there, there are some things that biofuels can teach, teach the oil industry about and how to improve their profits. But yeah. so, so if the price is too high, they don't want to invest because they have a alternative technologies. If it's too low, they don't want to invest because they don't have any money. So is there... Is there a sweet spot in there somewhere at you know sixty five fifty? Does anyone have the magic number? Where, you know, think, where, do they, where do they feel comfort? Um, well, I, I think it was you that wrote an article about this actually about the, where is where is the price that really fits with biofuels? Yes, happily about... I get to ask the questions. I never have to, <laughs> never have to answer them. So lucky I, me. I, I think it's clear though that uh, in the oil industry there's a saying which is the cure for low, low oil prices is low oil prices because it shuts down new drilling, it shuts down production, mm -hmm. and when you have a commodity in which the supply decreases directly correlated with the uh, price, but demands continue to increase. I think what we have is a misnomer that demand has somehow decreased. Uh, you can't go to, to China and India, wander around on the streets and say, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to buy a motorcycle because I've just decided that uh, we, we've got to decrease demand. They're buying motorcycles, mm -hmm. they're buying diesel pickup trucks uh, or diesel uh, vehicles. Uh, demand is increasing uh, in, in India and in China, in the U.S. actually, we're expected to be up again in 2015. So you have a story in which demand's increasing, supply is absolutely going down at these lower prices. Fracking, offshore, tar sands, yeah. rig counts. Yeah. You're just talking about a crashing rig count. You're talking about supply falling off a cliff. So what classically happens? Mr. OPEC was correct. You have, well, a short, you have a short yeah. squeeze. Yeah. What happens is that all this capacity goes out, and it doesn't happen in two days, but it happens in two years. And then you have a tremendous amount of profits made in a short period of time with a spiking oil price that brings on all those guys that got laid off from Schlumberger and everywhere yeah. else, brings them back to work. But investors have to be convinced this price is going to be here for a while. This tends to be an, uh, a short squeeze where you just don't have enough supply and then prices go to 150 bucks, which we were at 147 in June of 2008, as you may recall. recall. Mm. And so you get this pricing volatility. I think what's hazardous here is not the price of oil. It's policymakers who think the price of oil should determine policy. Rather than setting, we're going to go north by northwest and pointing that direction over a 15-year span, like the renewable fuel standard did, and sticking with the direction you're going, they tend to then wander left and right, depending on what the price of oil is doing and whoever's paying political donations that week. Okay, so five dollars, we got to do something. Two dollars, back to sleep. You know, watch exactly. the Oscars, have a but, good time. Yeah, I, I think, think it's important. Sorry, sorry to uh, <laughs> mention that when we talk about pain at the pump, we've been talking a lot about pricing, but Eric touched on this. It's also volatility. 
right? So you think of the individual consumer trying to budget for whatever amount of fuel they normally use, and when the price is all over the map, how do you plan for that? Then you look on the other end of the spectrum, the commercial sector. So you think of heavy duty trucking, they're moving freight here to there, and they have a set price. And so they can do fuel surcharges, but how do you plan your business with a tight margin business when the price is all over the map? So I think mm -hmm. the pain at the pump is not just a buy uh, defined as the price, but it's also the volatility as well. We, we've heard a lot about about um, in the power markets a lot less volatility. You know, when it comes to the actual mm -hmm. consumer, they pay almost you know like a, a a rate case price. And part of that we hear is because of because of the diversity of sources allows people to manage their. Is that is diversity a big deal? You, you cover a little bit on the on the power side from time to time. Yeah. What uh, <laughs> you know does, is that true that that diversity of of options? You know, the coal and nuclear and wind and solar um, give you an ability to manage the price a little bit better. Is that mm. is that true? Would that work with on the on the transport yeah. side? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way that if you are supplying, if you're a power company like I know Con Ed, you you look at you might take a twenty percent of your energy might be wind. Like in, in New York, it's about that, 20% is upstate wind farms. And that's a PPA, so they know their price for 10 years. They've, they've locked in that price. Mm -hmm. They are obviously hedging a bit because they might lose out one month again next month. And then a lot of it is nuclear, which is set at three cents, like that's stable. And the rest is coal and solar, which might go up and down. I think kind of what you were saying with fuels, mm -hmm. if you are a big consumer, like a trucking company, it makes sense, I think, to, to take a 20 or 30% offtake for a fuel that you know will stay the same price. I think the, the worry is, as you were saying, so much policy is set by oil. How do you fix your DME or your CNG price or your LNG price to actually not also fluctuate, and even ethanol, with the oil price? Because mm -hmm. as I see it, natural gas vehicles, LNG is just set at a dollar discount to diesel. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you get to a stage where those are actually reliable pricing aside from the price of So take away diversity helps, diversity helps manage prices, and so in fact diversification of the fuel supply is in fact the way mm -hmm. to keep pain at the pump. And I think so, so actually do more of what we were doing before is actually maybe the correct policy. Is that, and, and actually, is that fair? Diversity allows technology to come to bear. When you think about it, lack of diversity means lack of technology innovation. You're doing the same thing last year as you're doing next year, mm. why do you need technology? Diversity provides an opportunity for technology. Uh, the U.S. military is works probably, for Apple. I hear. Uh, it's yeah. worked Alternative platform there kind of the helps yeah. us. Uh, uh, I think uh, what we're looking at though is we have a big uh, U.S. customer that uh, consumes about three billion gallons a year of aviation biofuels, for example. Not going to be replaced by batteries anytime soon. Talk about volatility. You're trying to run an annual budget. Congress gives you money, and then the price of fuel uh, goes up because crude oil goes from $45 to $60. Now, most people would say, oh, it's $15. Think about mathematically. That's a 33% increase in your budgetary cost. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you start at 45 or some other mm -hmm. number. You have tremendous volatility. Their ability to use technology and, and, and renewable uh, sources of fuel to moderate that volatility is a major goal, just being able to budget how you're going to fight uh, and, and uh, keep your, your training uh, supply chains going is a big goal of the U.S. military. So mm -hmm. our takeaway is pain at the pump might, might, uh, might, might stay away if we have a little diversification in the fuels. We'll come back after this and we'll look at celebrity investors getting in the space and maybe providing some answers to those questions. Stay with us. We're back with the new voices, and we're about to get into the topic of celebrity investors. Who's in this space? Whether it, and we talked at the break a little bit about that. How, how do you define a celebrity investor? Everybody probably knows um, Richard Branson's in the space, but there's other ways to look at it. Eric, um, he's a shareholder in one of the, one of the ventures that you have. So, you know, why are these guys in the space? What you know, what's in it for them, and and how does that work? Well, there was an initial wave of enthusiasm when the federal policy was laid out to, so that between 2007 and 2022, investors could put massive amount of capital into biofuels and uh, have an assured market, the renewable fuel standard. And it attracted Richard Branson, who uh, got in the ethanol business. Uh, Vinod Khosla, a very famous venture capitalist, was a leader in the space. Uh, Jeffrey Skoll, for, for first uh, president of, of eBay, yeah. uh, put a, a lot of capital in, into uh, this uh, business. A lot of pension funds, CalPERS and others, got involved. But uh, I would actually like to say that the current generation of celebrities are folks you wouldn't necessarily consider to be t typical entertainment celebrities. But they do have a celebrity role, and that would be Tom Vilsack, former governor of Iowa, now the head of the U.S. Department of Ag, probably potentially the largest single investor in renewable fuels in the United States is Tom Vilsack. His ability to lead his organization and get them to focus on consistent policy and implementing policy 
uh, partially to offset what's happening to EPA, is uh, puts him in celebrity status. I can tell you there right now. So celebrity companies, who's who's in this space? And, and let's broaden it out. Look at, at all kinds of alternatives. What what kind of people are Rebecca? What who yeah. are we seeing in the space? Well, I'm seeing um, it's exciting to see people like Branson putting money uh, where his mouth is. The work uh, he founding the Carbon War Room and their work. One of the exciting programs I've been following is the Ten Island Challenge where he's uh, put to the Caribbean islands trying to get off of foreign oil, uh, become self-sustaining, using renewable energy, uh, finding ways to convert their wasted resources to some form of energy. So exciting to see there. But the, you also have celebrity companies in many ways. You think of folks like Apple and Google and what they're doing with their sustainability initiatives. And the rumors of Apple and an electric vehicle, are they developing mm -hmm. one? Google with their sustain, uh, sustainability initiatives. And so it's exciting to Coca -Cola see Coca-Cola doing the plant bottle as well. Exactly. And now Pepsi is following, uh, looks like uh, from a developmental space in, er, perspective into that space as well. So. Right, and you've seen on the material side of things, looking at packaging, Frito-Lays using uh, uh, degradable materials, different type, you know, everyone's looking at it differently besides there's the fuel component, but chemicals and uh, products that inevitably get Alternative disposed. plastics, I think Ford is using some mm -hmm. of those in, in mm -hmm. their vehicles, so it's it's pretty broad based. Right, different what, materials. What's the rationale? Is it, is it, is it, when we talk about sustainability, is it, is it because it's a, you know, kind of a greenwashing thing or is it to reduce mm -hmm. cost or is it to uh, get out of uh, price volatility on the materials? Yeah. Or? I, mean, I think it's, there's two reasons to do it. I think, as you were saying, a lot of investors saw actual opportunity to make money, and that's why a lot of people are in it. A lot of the people, I think, are doing it because it's a, it may be a greenwash or a bit of PR. I mm -hmm. think, I mean, if you look at Vincent Bolloré, he's the French billionaire, I think he um, is an industrialist, but he set up, um, I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's um, like an electric vehicle car sharing scheme in Paris. He's developing the batteries himself, the cars himself. He's spread it now to Indianapolis and to London. And I mean, why get involved in that over biofuels? I mean, why, why that particular area of renewable um, transport? And I think for that, maybe it's more exposure. He has his name on the cars. There's a lot more PR. It's a lot more exciting, I think, investing in biofuels. I don't know why, for some reason, maybe isn't that glamorous. And maybe that's what we need to try and do, is try and get it to be more visible. How well, is uh, a celebrity, could you really put your name on a biofuel? Well, you have, you have Bill Gates, who's not, was, maybe not the most glamorous celebrity. Yeah, but he was an $85 million investor in one of the companies I started, and he was a first-generation biofuels uh, funder through Cascade mm -hmm. Investments. Uh, I, I think, actually, though, we are now talking about institutional scale. Okay. This is no longer, gosh, me and three of my corn farmer friends are going to start an ethanol company, raise money from our neighbors. This is uh, the U.S. government scale. I would actually, now thinking about it, uh, put Secretary Mabus of the U.S. Navy, mm -hmm. a fellow who's proven himself to be a celebrity because he stood up in front of Congress and said, this is the way you na U.S. Navy is going to go. We're going to innovate. We're going to get diverse fuel. We're going to have more pricing consistency. Uh, we're going to be independent as a country, and I'm, a, I'm not going to buy my fuel to run my military engine from my enemies and then go bomb them. Yeah. And that requires some celebrity a kind uh, of, status. Kind of a nice little echo cycle there, you know, kind of a life cycle analysis, you know, actually <laughs> yeah. buy it, bomb your bomb fuel, them, fuel chain, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and then conquer it, take it out. Yeah. Exactly. Now, they were, of course, a great wind, en wind energy customer, but they had a little range anxiety, you know, there, so they kind of switched over to a slightly more dense fuel. but. Um, and they've been in nuclear for a long time, but Absolutely. apparently nuclear doesn't translate to the smaller ships, and that, that, is that the rationale? It's not floating, it's actually flying. The uh, U.S. Navy has a forward presence through aircraft uh, carriers. I was out right. in the USS Ronald Reagan, 100 miles off of uh, San Diego co coast, and at midnight we are flying F-18s off the deck. And this is just one big machine that burns jet fuel. Mm -hmm. That's what they do all day long, just burn jet fuel. And when you think about it, 42% of the crude oil in the United States is imported. So you're running a military machine with 42% of our supply chain being from a foreign country of some sort. Now, have you seen those funky fuels that they're making down at, at uh, China Lake, um, the, the, the Naval Weapons Research Area, where they're, they're looking, they're basically taking, I guess, pine cones, basically, the terpenes, you know, um, and converting those into super dense fuels that have up to, what, 7 to 10 percent more range, 7 to 10 percent more fuel density than the existing fuel. So it means that um, you can carry more payload, Fewer, so fewer jets on a mission, 
and you know fewer fewer boys in action for a, for a given objective. And they're developing new engines to run those new yeah. fuels. Mm -hmm. Is that is that real stuff or is that like you know it's 2050? It's real stuff, and in 2050 we'll be seeing a lot of it. <laughs> okay, so it, coming to a coming to a defense establishment near you. Okay? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So so um, you know what we we Paul Allen's in the space um, was an investor in through Vulcan in Imperium, I believe. Vulcan That's was an yeah, investor in there. Seattle. That's correct. Did pretty pretty well, uh, better than maybe with the Seahawks. You yep. know, had a little blip there at the end in, in the Super Bowl, but Imperium seems to be going well. Who else is in the space from a, from a, from a well-known company point of view? Uh, Koch Brothers. What are they doing in the space? <laughs> the Koch, Koch Brothers. Have, they have Flint Hills Resources. <laughs> yeah. An ethanol producer. And uh, when you think about it, the, the real celebrities we should all be talking about uh, have short names. Exxon, Chevron, Shell, BP, those should be the celebrities in this space. Why? Because it's their industry. Uh, this is the, the transition from the horse-drawn carriage to the Ford Motor car. Yes. And the real question is, are the guys that used to make car carriages now going to be competing with Mr. Ford? We yeah. already have some Mr. Fords. The question is, are the carriage guys going to show up? Very yeah. interesting look at food versus fuel with a horse. I mean, is that, you know, how did, how did, how did that work? Uh, is that food or fuel yeah, with a Yeah, there was an uh, academic who came to me recently and said, Eric, you know the land use change discussion should go back to the 1880s. We should look at how much land we're using to feed horses, which was our source of transportation. Or oxen. And statistically, yeah. <laughs> we have a significant reduction in the amount of actual land use for the transportation sector, mm -hmm. almost a 40% reduction in actual physical acres. Uh, required to feed our cars compared to what little to range anxiety horses. there with the oxen, you know, yeah. kind of little house in the prairie days. Yeah, that's right. why the Pony Express was every 20 miles you'd trade horses or so. That's I think right. It's important, you know, we talk about the celebrity investors and celebrity companies, but really at the end of the day, the celebrities are the innovators who are coming up with the new technologies. Who the celebrity technologists, yeah. Yes, they're developing their new fuels. You may never know their name, but their technologies are the ones that are going to. Uh, Provide the answer. Also, for the us. celebrity mm -hmm. organisms, too. You know, there's yes. little tiny microbes. They may be small, little, but little they're, 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 they're mighty. Little, little, they're the mighty <laughs> bacteria. So, well, we're going we're gonna to take a break and we're going to come back and we're going to look at the wonderful world of crazy microbes and what they can make in renewable chemicals and, and can renewable chemicals survive the oil price debacle. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to The New Voices. I'm Jim Lane, Biofuels Digest, and we're joined in this segment by our good friend Ron Cascone, who's a senior analyst with Nexent. And the question that we went to the break with, Ron, that you're going to help us with is in this, uh, as we were talking about mighty microbes and celebrity microbes that we're going to get into a little bit, um, a lot of them are used to make renewable chemicals and, you know, amazing materials. And there's a lot of talk that chemicals and these amazing materials might not survive the oil price debacle. What's, what, how's that going to work out? Are they all history? Did, it, did the movement start and then die? It really depends on, on which chemical you're talking about. If we're talking about polyethylene, uh, that is one step away from ethylene. What do we make for, with polyethylene? What, what's well, a good polyethylene is the most ubiquitous. Uh, Polymer in, in, in commerce. It's, glad it's, wrap? Glad wrap. There glad wrap, there you yeah, go. Yeah, well, Ziploc bags. Ziploc bags. Right, and uh, plastic retail bags. All kinds of stuff. Yeah, a lot of film, uh, also uh, containers of all kinds, uh, and uh, packaging of all kinds as well. So it's a very important chemical, and in, in, it's a very important polymer in, in commerce. And it is, uh, you know, its economics are improved by, uh, by lower oil prices. We've already got low gas prices, and a lot of, in this country, in the U.S., a lot of the polyethylene is made from gas condensates, not from petroleum. Now that the other, the rest of the world, which operates more on, on petroleum to make these plastics, to make ethylene to make these plastics, they are competing more with the U.S. Is, production of polyethylene. So the eth polyethylene prices around the world are much lower. So the, the prospect of making a polymer that competes with that polyethylene is, is more challenging. But fortunately, a polymer like PLA, for an example, polyelectric and polylactides. And that's used in 3D printing, right? Isn't polylactic acid I, I, one, of the, yeah, one of the resins? Yeah, among there? other things. But it, you know, the, the big volume use was in, in, in food service. And um, Food service, serving what? Um, well, spoons, forks, okay, there you go. plates, glasses. Everyday stuff. Everyday stuff, high volume stuff. And 
that material is biodegradable. So that's great. It's something that people want. But now you're starting to make PLAs that are higher performing as well and can compete with conventional polymers not only on the basis of biodegradability but on the basis of performance so that they can get a higher price because of that. Mm -hmm. Now now we haven't talked a little uh, very much about algae yet uh, in this in this uh, episode so um, and you've been studying a little bit on alginol I hear is yeah. the rumor so <laughs> so you know with with these kinds of technologies they have an ability to uh, some of the algae technologies not alginol in this case um, can make um, let's say high value nutraceuticals you know omega-3 fatty acids those mm. kinds of things that, that it replace uh, fish oil are those um, does that help the economics for those kinds of technologies? What, what's going on with algae? Yeah, I mean, I think, so, so a bit to your point, some biochemicals make exact replacements, so they would make an exact replica of nylon. Some are making bio-replacements that aren't quite the same, and I think algae kind of fits into that box, which makes it quite, I mean, they can make omega-3, and that's great, but they can also make fertilizer, fish feed, but it's not exactly the same as if you're replacing soybean meal with the algae. So I think that, that it's difficult for them because how big is the market? Could they replace all fish feed? And would they sell at the same price as soybean meal? Or, and so in that sense, algae is it's a bit more of a dark horse, I yeah. think, to so know it, really it, where it's going to be. A funky set of technologies out if there. You, if yeah. you start with end markets, though, uh, we look at the tire industry, which uses isoprene, butadiene, to make tires. Mm -hmm. Where do they come from? Well, that's a byproduct from the natural gas uh, process, and that uh, process is now changing. So the tire industry is going through enormous change. Natural rubbers come from the jungle areas where you have Ebola viruses, you've got a civil uh, unrest and, and guys bombing your, your facilities, and you're knocking down jungles, which has carbon intensity issues. That's a part of the supply chain for tires. So in our laboratory, uh, actually here at, at Maryland Biotech uh, Laboratory at the University of Maryland, we produce isoprene from sugar. Where does sugar come from? From starch. Where does starch come from? It happens to be mm. we have 91 and a half million acres of starch producing crop in the, in the United States. And no jungle and no Ebola, no, I hear. No jungle, yeah. uh, <laughs> only a few cases of Ebola uh, in the U.S. They've and, been quarantined uh, so, And they're probably not <laughs> in your lab. Yeah, exactly, right? a yeah. whole, whole lot more. Uh, You're not uh, studying that as, a, as a, what can Ebola do? Exactly. You know? <laughs> what, what can it do for me? Uh, yeah. But it, looking at it from a fuels point of view, uh, can it's, we modify it's, it? it's yeah. a $8 per gallon commodity. Ethanol is a dollar fifty, two dollar per gallon commodity. It's a high value chemical with a very large end market and very, very interested customers. These are customers that see these yeah. as, as supply chain problems and want to replace them with essentially what I call the sugar molecule. Whether you get it from sugar cane or you get it from starch is almost irrelevant. It all becomes a glucose molecule at the end of the day. So, so it's a market there if it's small. Small is beautiful. Is that is that well, the way I it works? I think it's yeah. important to think when you think about chemicals versus fuels, another important thing for some companies, some companies that's their target, they're always going to chemicals, they're always going to fuels, but some companies look at it as a stepping stone. So the environment today for let's say three years, the outlook is chemicals makes the most sense. It gives them a way to deploy their technology, start producing chemicals, work out the technology kinks, and start generating revenue. And when the market takes off in the fuel direction going that route, and that's one of the routes that we've looked at at our company is, okay, we can do an offtake today for methanol, and we can get our technology deployed, and as the market grows for DME, then we'll take another step. But other companies are doing this for in a variety of ways. So while some people may only go for chemicals versus fuels, some are using it as a way to deploy technology. So there's a stepping there's a stepping stone path there. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. So uh, thanks for joining us, Ron. Thanks for the to our panelists, and uh, join us again next time on the New Voices. Thank you.